I'm Doug Gerlach. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Small Cap Informer Stock Newsletter, focusing on smaller opportunities in the equities market. And I'm here today to talk about some of uh, our best ideas for the rest of 2019 and through 2020 and beyond. Uh, our uh, approach to small cap stock investing is based in a very common sense fundamental approach. I'll talk a little bit about that as I present some of our top ideas uh, for the next, uh, the next year uh, and beyond. Uh, first, let's review a little bit where we are in terms of the small cap markets relative to other market segments. Here is a graph of the year-to-date performance of the uh, S&P 500 representing the broader market, the small cap uh, 600 uh, representing the small cap market, and the Europe, Australasia, Far East index. Uh, the S&P 500 in blue on top is up 19% uh, year to date through Thursday. The green represents the S&P small cap 600 up 14%, and the red at the bottom is the EFA index up about uh, about uh, uh, almost 10 and a half uh, 10 and a half percent. So uh, year to date. Uh, for the broader market, it, performance is actually very strong, uh, although it doesn't often feel like that with the return to volatility. Uh, and the small cap market started out strong in the beginning of the year uh, and have since uh, fell in, fallen by the wayside a little bit, eclipsed by the returns in the broader market. But if we focus on the long term over the last 15 years, uh, here is a graph that represents the cumulative performance of the S&P small cap 600 index up 222 uh, percent and the broader market, the S&P 500 index, up 164 percent. And that's what we like to pay attention to, that discrepancy between the returns of smaller company stocks versus larger company stocks. Uh, and over the long term, we believe uh, you can boost the returns of any equity portfolio by adding in a healthy dose of small company stocks. Uh, and uh, we're not suggesting that you need to go 100% into small caps uh, in your stock portfolio, but uh, our newsletter is designed to help provide some ideas for the smaller company uh, exposure within your equity approach. And we keep this particular graph in mind that over the long term, we're going to capture a higher total return if we can include some small company stocks in our portfolio. So let me tell you how we approach uh, analyzing small company stocks uh, for our newsletter. There are four principles, basic principles that we follow that are part of our parent organization, Better Investing's educational principles for investors. The first is we believe you should be investing regularly in the market. And the corollary is that we, we don't suggest that you try to time the market, that you try to say, uh, to try to move money around according to expected results from particular market segments, that you don't try to move cash to the sidelines because you believe a bear market is coming. Uh, there have been a number of investors who three years ago were convinced that a bear market was coming. Uh, they moved their money out of the market and now we've seen significant gains in the last three years in the broader equity markets. We don't want to miss the upside. Uh, so we believe if you focus on the long term, uh, you can mitigate the exposure to down cycles in the broader market. Our approach to investing is definitely looking for quality, well-run businesses, but only buying them at the right price. So we look for evidence of managerial excellence. We look at profitability. We look at other metrics that indicate that this is a sound, well-run, business, uh, and then we bide our time and we wait for the price to be right, because the market will always give you an opportunity uh, because of its uh, focus on the short term. We believe in diversification as a risk management strategy, uh, diversifying into companies uh, by size, so including small, mid-cap, and small-cap stocks, as well as diversifying across many sectors and industries. Uh, and that will help protect you. There are particular industries that are not as sensitive to economic cycles, for instance, so including a, 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 a healthy heaping of those types of companies in your portfolio can help when the market does hit a down cycle or the economy uh, goes into recession mode. And then we hold for the long term. It does not mean we hold and never sell. 
Uh, it doesn't mean that we buy and forget. It just means that we have an objective of trying to capture the total returns for each company that we follow over a five year plus horizon. We'll sell when necessary. We will monitor in the, in the, in the near term, uh, but we won't be swayed uh, by uh, near term market moves or short term changes in the direction of particular companies. Uh, and selling is definitely part of our strategy. We try to be prudent in the sell decision and override the natural inclination that individuals have uh, to hold on to companies and uh, not generate losses because it makes us feel bad. Uh, and it, you'll feel worse when your portfolio doesn't perform. So you try to balance that out in our approach. Now, in particular, our small company stock approach is based on these five principles. Uh, first of all, we are not chasing returns. Uh, we're trying to, uh, we're not swinging for the bleachers every time we get it back. We're just trying to get on base on a regular, consistent basis. And that will generate the home run, the runs uh, that we need to outperform the market. So we're not advertising 6,000% total returns. We're not focused on penny stocks or micro cap stocks or emerging companies for the most part. We're looking at small, well-run businesses that simply get overlooked because of the dynamics of the broader market. We're looking for well-managed businesses, particularly companies with solid profit margins, uh, it's margins potentially that could be growing but are at minimum uh, stable over time. We're looking at growth drivers, uh, what the company is doing to survive in the current climate and expand their footprint. Uh, so we're looking at all the evidence that the executives behind a particular company are performing well. Our approach uh, demands uh, a particular discipline when we execute buy transactions, looking to buy at the reasonable prices. But that means we're looking at attractive prices uh, and uh, irrational prices. And often the market is giving us gifts by saying, oh, this company is, uh, uh, has stumbled and gives the price a 30% haircut. For us, that's like buying a stock on sale if the, if the drivers are still there for the long term. So often we, we might be finding uh, what we call fallen angels, good companies that have temporarily hit a, a rough patch. And when we take advantage of those opportunities, we can increase our total return. Our objective in every stock is to hold for the long term. Uh, but we're not going to be, we're going to try to be as logical and rational about that as possible. Uh, and we're not going to ignore companies. In the newsletter, we update uh, the, our, our buy and sell prices on at least a quarterly basis. We analyze the earnings reports that come out of companies. Uh, we're managing uh, to those uh, expectations which help, help us craft that proper uh, appropriate uh, target for the long term. And then finally, uh, we will sell when fundamentals are deteriorating or when the outlook is uncertain. We want it to, we're trying to capture the benefit that comes from by, uh, holding these companies for the long term. If there are factors that are interfering with the progress of the company, then we're going to uh, replace those companies in the, in the, uh, the service. So let's talk about tough markets because certainly the last couple of years have re, uh, reintroduced volatility to the market and uh, uh, if you follow the markets by turning on the television, uh, you will get all sorts of stories about what's going on in the broader market. Uh, so let's talk about some of the factors that are driving the current market and, and how we approach those. Uh, first of all, uh, the laws of supply and demand govern uh, pricing in the market of, uh, of equities. Uh, and stock valuations are always going to be driven by those supply and demand needs of investors. But in bull markets and bear markets both, there are lots of things that drive uh, the demand. Uh, interest rates, as interest rates have been historically low and now appear to be declining once again, that means that a lot of investors who would prefer to have their money in a, quote, safe harbor of an interest-bearing account or CDs uh, simply are not getting enough return. Nobody's excited about a 1.5% interest rate on your long-term savings. So that's keeping people in the equities market. Uh, and when you've got people in the market, that means demand is strong for stocks. And that's been helping to push uh, the equities uh, uh, further upward. And as long as those interest rates remain low, uh, that's going to be the case, and it appears 
that from a management perspective, uh, the Fed is not going to be pushing up those rates at a fast enough rate that's going to deter investors from uh, investing in equities. Certainly economic indicators uh, as they come out, and economic indicators are always a mixed bag. Uh, there's never a, a period of time where all of the economic indicators are, are chugging in the, right, in the same direction. Uh, so you've always got uh, some economists who cherry pick particular indicators and point to factors that are uh, perhaps negative. Uh, but when you look at the big picture, the U.S. economy is still uh, quite strong. Market sentiment swings and ebbs and flows in, in a daily or even hourly or even every few minutes. Uh, the direction of the market is subject to change. Uh, and certainly, if enough people believe that a bear market is coming, guess what happens? A bear market will come. Uh, so far, investors are still pretty positive, uh, all in all. Fundamental performance uh, drives long-term performance of equity markets. That is, if companies do well, their prices will go up over time. In the short term, fundamentals don't always drive the direction of individual companies. Uh, and certainly, fear is a big driver. Uh, we try to eliminate the, that aspect of investing. And our approach being so common sense and, and just grounded in principles that allow you to say, well, this is completely logical. If the rest of the market wants to act irrationally, there's nothing I can do about that. Eventually, they're going to come around and see what we're seeing right now, uh, that uh, there is a lot of potential in this particular company. And that's the benefit of company analysis. Instead of trying to gauge trends, which are subject to all sorts of uh, variables. Uh, and as I mentioned, bond yields and interest rates are still low, going to be low for the foreseeable future, and that will continue to support growth of equities. Uh, if we do see interest rates starting to climb up, then we're going to see investors pulling out of equities, and that's going to contribute to perhaps um, a, a bear market or a correction uh, in the broader market. Um, secondly, the short term, what happens in the market in the short term has no impact really on what happens over the long term. Uh, it, particularly in the short term, a lot of the drivers that I just discussed that, that are pushing the market one way or another are not rational. We have to acknowledge that. In the short term, all sorts of factors can, can push the market up, down. You see uh, on uh, television, financial TV shows, they, they attempt to explain what's driving the market any particular day. Uh, what's driving it up, what's driving it down. Yesterday, the market went down. Uh, you can find a lot of explanations, but one of them had to do with uh, the, the uh, release of potential plans to, uh, to uh, uh, deter U.S. investment in China, and that had the impact of driving the market down in the U.S., according to pundits. Just one example. What's the impact over the long term? Probably not as significant. And even in the short term, uh, such a plan would take many months to implement uh, before we would feel those effects. In the long term, we must remember that one thing drives stock prices higher uh, guaranteed, and that is if a company makes money consistently, over time, the value of that business goes, goes up, the share price of that company's stock increases. In the short term, anything's possible, but sound fundamentals eventually will beat out all of the other market behaviors. Uh, so we have our, our perspective uh, that built in to our approach uh, to focus on that particular element. Uh, it gives us a horizon into the future. Uh, when we've got bull markets as we had the last few years into the seven, eight years of the, of the current bull market, uh, the, the irrational behavior of investors often drives a lot of companies into overvaluation, overvaluation territory. Uh, and so there's a trap there. You can get stuck uh, chasing returns for the hot stock of the day, whether it's Tesla or Beyond Meat or uh, any of the other fads that kind of come through without a lot of evidence that these companies are going to be long-term survivors. Uh, again, we don't suggest that you avoid those businesses, but uh, overloading on those types of companies we think is detrimental to your long-term results. And if we have a correction, that's probably a healthy thing. From, from our perspective, a correction is an immediate 10% uh, plus uh, discount on the market, and that's when there are opportunities uh, in 
December, right before Christmas, uh, investors got a big Christmas gift that they knew what to look for on December 24th when the market took a dive. And a lot of companies settled down in price, uh, and there were a lot of bargains in the market that were gone two weeks later. Uh, and so we want to be prepared to step in. If you don't have cash available, you have the ability to replace particular companies with better opportunities. Uh, so we're dynamic in that approach to our uh, selection. Uh, as I mentioned, when we do have a sell-off, uh, there will be a panic, uh, and that will generate a lot of irrationally low opportunities for long-term focused investors. Uh, so we maintain uh, you know, our buy and sell points on all of our equities, and when the market gives us an opportunity, we want to be prepared to take care of them, take advantage of them. We do not buy the market, we're buying individual companies. So what happens to the market may affect the price of a particular business, but it doesn't affect the business of a particular business, right? So if the, we do have a bear market, companies are going to continue to develop their products and services, sell those products and services, and make money, regardless of what their share price is doing. So that, for us, gives us opportunities to seek out those good companies at good prices. Uh, when we have bear markets, uh, it's amazing that uh, uh, we have a lot of fear-mongering in the media, and uh, people tend to forget that bear markets always end. We have never, in the history of uh, the, the stock market, had a bear market that didn't end. But yet a lot of investors uh, react as if the bear market is the, is the, end, the ending day uh, of all things and uh, try, to, try to act in what they see as a, a reasonable fashion. If you look at the statistics, the average bear market lasts 10 months. Uh, and it happens every three and a half years. Now, we're seven years plus into the current bull market, and we haven't had a bear market. So our approach is we're always ready for the downside, but we're not driven to action because of it. Uh, and anyone who says uh, that here are steps to take during a bear market, our approach is that during bear markets, your strategy doesn't change uh, other than you now have uh, a whole much expanded menu of stocks that you can purchase at reasonable prices. So from our perspective, uh, you know, if I had my druthers for the next 15 plus years, uh, if we had a bear market while I was investing in my 401k, uh, and then the day that I retire, we'd have a bull market, uh, and values would rise uh, significantly, that would be a great thing. Uh, and so we keep your focus on the long term. Bear markets are not uh, nasty things. Yeah, it's not unpleasant to open up your brokerage account statement and see, yeah, you're down 20%. But on the other hand, when the bear, bull market returns, uh, you're going to be back up 20% plus. Uh, and if you continue to invest and manage your portfolio during that downturn, you're going to be better off uh, when the bear market does end. So we're using, uh, when we have opportunities in the current market, when volatility gives us opportunities, when market corrections arrive, we're going to take care of uh, uh, our portfolio and nurture it during those periods. Uh, if you've got uh, depreciated securities at year end, stocks that have gone down in your taxable accounts, uh, we definitely would say let's take advantage of those, sell those or temporarily sell those, capture the capital losses, offset some gains if you've got some rationally high securities, uh, trade them out uh, during that period, uh, and that will help you uh, to, to mitigate the damage of market corrections by taking advantage of some of the, the uh, tax loss and tax swap opportunities uh, that are available to you. Uh, one of the questions that I get most frequently during bull markets when stocks are rationally high in many cases is what to do with stocks that are overvalued. One of the things we talk about is using trailing stop loss orders, uh, which will set it down some downside protection. So if you do have a 12% decline very suddenly uh, in a stock, uh, the stock will get sold automatically. But as long as the stock is continuing to rise, your trailing stop will follow along. So you'll be able to benefit from the continued increase uh, driven by irrational market behavior, but yet protected on the downside uh, by a little bit. When you've got uh, volatility available to you, um, you can use that available cash. We, our focus on portfolio management is, is 
basically to constantly be trying to improve the overall quality and return of your portfolio. So if you can swap out companies, um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and again, look at the, the entire uh, mechanism of your equity portfolio, not just one or two companies out of it, and try to see what you can do to increase the projected total return of that portfolio. Uh, and when we do have companies that are expensive, uh, we're going to take steps uh, because you know that the value pendulum swings from overvalued to undervalued. So when the pendulum is at the maximum range of the overvalued stage, uh, there's not much upside left. So you want to protect on the downside when that happens. And then finally, our focus is on the coming good times in the future. With a five-year-plus horizon, that means we're looking to 2025. And there's no one in this room, there's no investor really who can ignore the long-term effects of the market unless you've got uh, your retirement set and you can live on a 4% return from your portfolio and drain it down on an indefinite basis going forward, in which case you probably wouldn't be here at the money show. Uh, so from our perspective, everyone can focus on growth in, that, in a, a longer-term uh, portfolio, especially for a portion of your portfolio, if not for all of it. Uh, so whatever happens in the next five years, if we have a recession, if we have a bear market, guess what? They're going to be done by 2025. We're going to be on the next up cycle. If we don't have a recession for the next couple of years, you know, again, at that rolling five-year period going forward uh, gives us a focus on the next plateau. We're going to ignore the valley in between. We're going to take action along the way, but we're not going to get too obsessed with it. We're going to focus on what's happening five years down the road. Uh, when the market will have recovered, when the economy will be on a new upswing, uh, when all the factors will be in place to drive the market, again, to newer highs down the road. So with that in mind, let's talk now about uh, some of our best ideas for 2020 and beyond. Uh, these are, there's actually uh, the top ideas. I've got 12 companies that I've pulled out. These are all companies that we follow in our small cap informer newsletter. A couple of these companies are also followed in our broader market stock newsletter, the Investor Advisory Service. That Investor Advisory Service newsletter has been on the Holbert Investment Newsletter Honor Roll for the last nine years uh, for outperforming every bull and bear market cycle for the last, uh, since the, the late 1990s. Uh, so the approach we use in both newsletters is essentially uh, the same. Uh, but these are focused on smaller uh, into mid-sized companies. Uh, and so another caveat is uh, at, we, we are a small cap stock newsletter. Occasionally we buy a small company stock. And the problem with the small cap investing is uh, that if the companies perform well, guess what? They become mid-cap stocks. So a couple, some of these companies are probably closer to a mid-cap definition. Uh, and uh, I keep, we, we continue to manage them in the newsletter and follow them in the newsletter. Uh, and the rationale is that for most of our subscribers and probably for most of you, even a small mid-cap stock is a lot smaller than the companies that you already own. Most individual investors focus on uh, uh, large cap consumer facing brand name companies. Uh, and so you're often overweighted in those big stocks. Uh, so adding a small mid cap can, can provide some additional uh, total return to your portfolio. So as always, do your, return, your research and remember that cheap stocks can always get cheaper. Uh, and that's just a, a, a rule of thumb for the entire market. Uh, so we've got a summary table in your handout um, here on the screen. Uh, the highlighted stocks are the ones that are, as of Thursday, were in the buy zone, uh, according to our most recent analysis. Uh, and so you can see there are three out of these 12 companies that are slightly above uh, our or, or outside of our buy uh, range. Uh, so those we would say, you know, do your own analysis. Uh, sometimes for those companies, uh, we would suggest a dip the toe in the water approach, where you pick up a few shares, get it on your radar, follow it, and then be able to take advantage when uh, the, the price is more reasonably uh, uh, set according to the longer term approach. We're gonna quickly go through all of these uh, particular companies. Uh, we're, I'm going to show you two graphs for each, and I'll talk about the companies. This is a graph of the long-term, uh, the 10-year history, uh, is, or as many years as the company has 
On the top in green is the sales line represented by S. The P is the pre-tax profit line. Uh, that's in pink or magenta, and the E is the earnings per share line. You'll see below that the annual high and low prices in the, the little black I bars. Uh, it, there will also be an analyst estimate uh, in many cases for sales and earnings going forward. Uh, so the current, most recent fiscal year is in the middle of the graph, uh, and then we have a five-year period going forward. Uh, the, there is a, this, there's a projected growth line uh, to the right of the current fiscal year that represents our estimation of the sales and earnings growth of the company uh, over the next five years. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, let me talk about air lease. We've been c covering air lease since about 2013, uh, shortly after it went public. This is an airline leasing business. They buy planes from Boeing and Airbus. They lease them to airlines uh, around the, uh, the world uh, on all six continents, so they are uh, all over uh, the globe. Airlines often like to lease planes because uh, they don't have the capital or the, the ability to borrow the amounts of money that are required to buy planes in many cases. Uh, you know, for instance, Delta's credit rating is just a, a step above investment grade. Uh, American Airlines uh, debt rating is, is very close to junk. Uh, and again, airlines have a history of going bankrupt, so if you were to loan money to an airline, you would require them to pay a much higher interest rate because of their, their propensity to default uh, on their obligations. So uh, many airlines, especially those that might be in startup mode, will lease planes. So AirLease uh, has a great business model. They get capital from shares and from borrowing money. Uh, issuing shares, and then they use that capital to buy planes, and then they just re recoup over time uh, the lease payments. Uh, airlines are responsible for the insurance, for the upkeep, for the maintenance of the planes. Uh, Airlines has some side businesses. They have a side partnerships that they manage that takes institutional money, puts it into funds, buys planes with the, that institutional money uh, in those partnerships. Airlease gets a management fee from those particular uh, opportunities. So that's another revenue stream. They do some consulting as well. Held back a little bit in the last couple of years because of interest rates. Interest rates kind of creeping up. Uh, but Airlease, again, just a well-managed business. They're managing their cost of capital very closely. Uh, they are uh, have the op opportunity to borrow money from around the world. Uh, they have a great ratio of fixed rate borrowing to variable rate borrowing, so they can take advantage of uh, lower rates uh, as they become available. So uh, from a credit quality standpoint, uh, I think Airlease is doing very well. Uh, in the last, uh, the last year, uh, the Boeing Air Max uh, fiasco has uh, held back Airlease, even though uh, they, it's less than 5% of their fleet and uh, they have options to purchase more uh, that they probably won't be exercising. Uh, but uh, as I said, they're able to uh, buy from, from Airbus as well as Boeing uh, big planes. Uh, another factor is when airlines go bankrupt, uh, Airlines has already ha experienced that several times. They're able to recover those planes, turn them around, and then release them out to customers on their waiting list. One of the things we like about Air Lease is their order book for the next two years is uh, pretty much set and pretty much full. So we know, and Air Lease knows, how many planes they'll be taking on order from the manufacturers and leasing out, how much their leasing payments are going to be generating. Uh, as interest rates go up, the lease payments have interest rate riders on them. So if interest rates go up, the, leases, the, the amount that Air Lease takes in in leases uh, goes up as well. Globally, air traffic is growing at 6% a year, and that's an increase over where it was three or four years ago. So there are a lot of factors driving air lease going forward. One of the things we like, this is the pre-tax profit margin, percentage of every dollar of revenue that air lease takes in uh, that, is tax, uh, that is profit before taxes. So you can see it uh, has been as high as 41%. Now it's uh, just around 39%. That means that every dollar that they take in in revenue 39 cents of it is profit, and then they pay taxes on that. That's a phenomenal margin. It's a great business to be in. Airlease is, I think, a great opportunity. Uh, they have uh, 
Uh, we've seen their PE ratio contracting uh, to ridiculously low rates um, uh, uh, levels over the last couple of years. But I think there's a lot of growth potential left for Airlies as we go forward. It's a transportation stock. It's also a financial stock. So it kind of straddles those industries in your portfolio, provides some exposure uh, to those different types of industries. Boot Barn is a company we've been following in our small cap newsletter. Uh, for uh, for about a year. It's been in our, uh, it was recommended yesterday in our broader market newsletter, the Investor Advisory Service. So that's hot off the press. Uh, I have a little bit, m slightly more conservative view about Boot Barn than our, our, the uh, analysts in, uh, who write our broader market newsletter, but I still think there's a lot of potential for it. Uh, Boot Barn is a consumer, a chain of consumer stores focusing on Western themed wear. Uh, so cowboy boots, cowboy hats, uh, not only for fashion forward uh, individuals, but also functional. So if you are a working ranch hand, you can buy your work gear at a boot barn store. If you just want to look like Miranda Lambert, you know, country western star, you can buy those sequined uh, outfits at boot barn as well. So focus on the west coast. Think, you know, Texas. Um, and beyond. And you can see the growth there, $770 million in revenue. Uh, they've been expanding their store footprint. They've also been buying smaller, uh, smaller outlets, so smaller chains, maybe a, a chain of five stores. They will buy those, wrap them in. They've got an e-commerce uh, uh, online store as well. Um, they're expanding this, uh, their celebrity focused fashion line, uh, which is opening up new avenues for them as they go. So uh, over the last, uh, you know, five years, seven years, uh, revenues have grown 21 percent. Um, earnings since 2012 up 70 percent um, on an annualized basis. So phenomenal growth coming out of the, the company, but uh, that's going to slow down a little bit. I'm looking for 14 percent annual growth as we go forward there. Uh, and management is just continuing to open stores. That's really going to help the business uh, going forward. Um, and here, this tells the story of a management team that is working hard to be efficient. Those margins are increasing uh, from as low as, um, uh, you know, a half a percent up to uh, in excess of 6% in the most recent fiscal year. So again, you can compare margins if you look at air lease making 39%. Uh, uh, on each dollar. Uh, Boot Barn makes 6% on each dollar, and that's very comparable for a retail uh, store outlet. Uh, but that, that margin has been going up, and that's a, a terrific, terrific tale. It means they're managing uh, their cost of, of goods, they're managing marketing, general ex and administrative expenses, they're managing all of the costs, uh, the employee costs, the energy costs that go into their business, uh, and they're able to see those margins increase on a fairly consistent basis. Um, you see one uptick in 2014. If you take that out, you can see that every other year they've been increasing uh, pretty steadily. So we like that quite a bit. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for Boot Barn, um, particularly as you move out west. You know, again, here, you're not as likely to see a lot of people wearing cowboy boots and, uh, and cowboy hats uh, or requiring uh, ranch hand uh, work gear. But uh, in the western part of the country, this is still an enormous market for the company. Biospecifics Technology, BSTC, is a biopharmaceutical company. They're focused on collagenase-based uh, therapies uh, to treat uh, fibrosis, uh, uterine fibroids, uh, um, uh, Peyronie's disease, uh, so various diseases and inflammations of the connective tissue in the human body. Um, so they have a product called Zeaflex that's one of the leading treatments for this. They've been expanding that out. They've got a strong patent portfolio going out to the 2030s and beyond. Um, you can see growth has been uh, pretty consistent uh, since 2011. Sales have been growing about 18% a year. Still a very tiny company at $33 million, one of the smallest that we cover. Uh, but I think it's got a good good pot potentials going forward. Um, you know, again, I would think that a company like this would be very attractive from an acquisition perspective, uh, it, but it's just a, a very small business as they're going forward. Again, the profit margins tell us the story here. That means that as the company is ex getting bigger, they're making more uh, money on every dollar of revenue going in there. Uh, and those margins are 75%. 
So that is a phenomenal story, uh, phenomenal level of profitability for a company like this. As they expand internationally, um, there are more markets that are opening up to them. Again, not without its risks being such a small business, but uh, we just feel like this is a, a good early stage company. They're just making money already. Uh, and they've got a good growth trajectory going forward. So if we can buy them when they're attractively priced, um, this is a good, uh, good company to include in your uh, pharmaceutical healthcare portfolio. Century Communities, a ticker is CCS, is a home builder. Uh, they are one of the 10 biggest home builders in the United States, and you've never heard of them, I can tell. Uh, they uh, were, when we started covering them, they were a top 25 home builder. Uh, they've grown, they've made some acquisitions, they're expanding their geographical footprint. Uh, ho uh, the home building uh, market uh, industry, uh, since 2007, the, the financial housing crisis uh, has been rebuilding. Uh, a lot of investors, I think, are still a little gun shy about the home building market. And we've certainly seen a slowdown in home starts, but especially strong at the high end. So in terms of luxury homes, homes of 800 to a million dollars, some of the big home builders making, bu buying, reti building retirement communities down south, uh, those uh, home starts there are really slowing off. And when people talk about the housing market, they're often focused on those particular types of companies. However, Century Communities make starter homes. They're building homes for uh, first-time home buyers, and their starting their purchase prices range, you know, are somewhere around two hundred and sixty, two hundred eighty thousand um, dollars. Sometimes as low as two hundred forty thousand dollars, depending on the area of the country. Uh, and that market is still very strong, because it's hard to buy a house for that little amount of money in desirable areas. Uh, so Century Communities is able to isolate uh, geographic regions around the country, whether it's outside of Seattle or in Northern California or Las Vegas or North Carolina uh, or near Atlanta, where there's demand. Uh, and some of the demographics, if you step back and look at the demographics, what's driving uh, the home building market in the entry level area. It has to do with the millennials. And we think about the millennials, we're thinking about 20 somethings. Well, now the oldest millennials are almost 30 years old. Right? And they're tired of living in a loft downtown in, with roommates. They want to settle down. And they're doing what they swore they would never do, which is move to the suburbs like their parents did. And so there is a big drive out of the cities by this particular age group in their late 20s where they're ready to settle down. They're ready to buy a house, uh, and these communities that Century Communities uh, offers include uh, options for solar energy or wind-powered energy. Uh, they're pre-wired for ultra-fast internet, which is very important to this buying community, this uh, home buying community uh, group of uh, purchasers of first-time homes. Uh, so they have the amenities that this group is looking for. Uh, so this has been driving growth of the, of the business. Um, they have, as I said, they've been making acquisitions. In the last quarter, revenues were up 16.6%. Uh, and they, uh, you know, we're expecting something like that uh, in the 15% plus range over the next few years. Yeah, if we do have a recession, we might see a slight uh, pause in their uh, in their, um, uh, their growth trajectory. Uh, I, I will caution you that debt is a little high relative to maybe perhaps some other companies that you're familiar with, but I'll remind you as well that as a home built by, uh, maker of, builder of homes, if you're gonna build a house, the first thing you need is the land. So uh, they have invested in property and options to buy property in desirable locations. Uh, so they've got about a three to four year backlog of land on which to buy, which is a good, healthy uh, 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 amount of land on which they can buy, build future communities. Uh, some of the debt they took on to make an acquisition of a southeast uh, U.S. Uh, home builder, um, they've been paying that off very rapidly. So uh, we expect that debt level to come back down to be more in line with the industry. Uh, we also cover another company called LGI Homes. Uh, LGI Homes tends to get whipsawed by the market, by short sellers. Every, uh, like with retail stocks, the home builders every, every month announce the results for the month, how many homes they sold. And it gives the bears an opportunity uh, to try to punish the company or talk them down. 
uh, Century Communities, again, has been very strong going forward. Um, you can see at the very bottom, the price bars are a little, a little subdued. Um, the growth has still been strong, earnings are strong, um, sales are strong. You can see sales growing a little bit faster than uh, earnings on this graph. And uh, when we look at the margins, you'll see that as well. Um, but uh, still a long-term performance picture. So this is the only example of a, a, a company here where the, the margins have been declining a little bit as the company uh, has, you know, they've wrung so much excess out of the market. Now they're able to price homes a little more competitively, which means they make a little bit less on their, uh, the, the homes they're selling. Uh, so the margin's coming down. It's still on a very healthy range from our perspective. Uh, and so uh, we're not so concerned about this particular decline in profitability. Uh, but I think this is an interesting opportunity. Uh, Duncan Brands, you're probably familiar with. Uh, this is a company we've been following for the last year or so, $1.3 billion in global sales in 2018, according to how we look at the, uh, the metrics of this particular business. Um, a little bit slower growth opportunity, not as much of a growth company as some of the others we follow, but we still think there's a, a, some opportunity to unlock some value uh, in Duncan Brands. Uh, so as they have been rebranding stores, as they continue on an ongoing basis to modify their menu, uh, to make it more efficient, to expand beyond the, uh, the, breakfast, uh, the breakfast time period of the day before noon when they've been strongest. What do you do in the afternoon if you're Dunkin' Donuts? Um, they've been experimenting with sandwiches and with, uh, but in the end of the day, people go to Dunkin' for the coffee. And uh, that's, uh, uh, especially here in the East Coast, they've got a big print, uh, brand presence. Uh, they also own Baskin Robbins, which is the ice cream chain, uh, which is their afternoon uh, driver of revenue. This is what we like about the company is over the last few years, they've been expanding their profitability. They're getting more and more profitable uh, with every dollar of donuts and coffee they sell. sell. And so we like that uh, particular uh, approach. And you can see uh, margins up to 40%. And again, this is Duncan. Uh, not, the, not necessarily the performance of the franchises, the franchise owners, but of, on a corporate level, this is what Duncan is able to do. Uh, and that's what we like about this particular company. Uh, this, we cover a couple of real estate investment trusts in our portfolio. Uh, this is one of the newest we've started covering. It's Physicians Realty Trust. Uh, so as a REIT, uh, they're required to pay out more than 90% of their profits every year, in which case they don't pay uh, corporate income taxes. Uh, ticker is DOC. You can see revenue is growing uh, uh, quite a bit. They took a tumble at the end of last year as one of their big clients went bankrupt. Uh, within a couple of months, they were able to turn around that facility at a higher uh, level of uh, uh, rent, uh, and they kept the deposit from the company that went bankrupt, of course. Um, so uh, a couple of years of a vacancy, a couple of months of vacancy, but now going forward, um, their portfolio is going to be back up to speed. Um, no pre-tax profit margin because they don't pay taxes. Uh, this is SM Financial. They make, uh, 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 are, are making, uh, related to uh, our home building industry, they're making uh, the insurance um, uh, that uh, home builders pay, uh, home buyers pay to the bank if you don't have your down payment. Uh, and so uh, that insurance uh, is uh, highly profitable for Essent. They're taking market share uh, from the big players uh, in the private mortgage insurance market, the PMI market, uh, and that's uh, really able to drive growth. $700 plus million dollars in revenue last year. Uh, and again, profitability is very strong. Last year, eight, more than 85% of their revenues was profit. So a great business to be in, conservatively managed balance sheet to cover the insurance losses as they come up. Evercore is an investment bank, uh, two, $2 billion last year. A little bit of a contrarian pick. Uh, people would say if we've got a uh, recession coming in the next few years, an investment bank might not be the best place to go. But as a boutique investment bank, uh, they are involved in a lot of high-level deals, and that's been uh, providing them with the opportunity to grow uh, over time. Uh, I think they're, they could be growing revenues for the next few years in the 18% range, revenues and earnings. Uh, and so again, profitability uh, on an upswing. That's what we like to see for these particular companies. 
Fleet Corps provides fleet management cards to uh, trucking fleets, transportation fleets. So these cards give drivers discounts uh, and track the spending on fuel, on supplies, on, uh, on lodging, et cetera. Uh, they can be used to pay tolls. They can be used to McDonald's restaurants. The spending automatically goes back to headquarters so that can reimburse drivers for spending on those cards. Uh, Fleet Corps has been expanding their, uh, their, their guidance. Uh, so they've been per performing quite well. They have a South American operation as well, so they're expanding globally, $2.4 billion. But you can see the trajectory of growth has been phenomenal uh, for this particular company. Margins have rebounded since 2015 and now at a 10-year high. So again, that tells us a good story. NV5 Global is a gl uh, an engineering company. Uh, engineering construction consultants business, uh, $400 million in revenue. So very small, but they've been performing very well. They've made some acquisitions uh, and they are uh, growing uh, nicely, doing both co uh, contracts for commercial businesses as well as government projects. And they've done some very high level uh, sports stadium type uh, uh, projects and, and uh, municipal uh, developments uh, that help them uh, keep their uh, project backlog in good shape. And you can see margins, uh, again, pretty strong for what they're doing in their business. Uh, SSNC Technologies provides software for the financial industry, so back end for asset managers uh, and other, um, uh, other uh, uh, hedge fund managers, mutual funds, et cetera. Based in Connecticut, uh, they made a big acquisition last year that almost uh, increased their revenues by uh, 40%. So now at $3.8 billion, one of the largest co companies we cover, uh, had a little bit of a hiccup in the last quarter, so the price is pretty attractive. Over the longer term, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for S, S, and C, and you look at the margins, again, you'll see this constant trend, very st recent strength in all of these companies, uh, and that's what we look for. And then finally, uh, TPI Composites, sort of a special situation stock. I like it. This is a maker of wind turbine blades made out of composite materials. Uh, they've uh, restructured some plants in the last year. Uh, they've had some customer realignment in the last year. Essentially, they manufacture in Turkey, Mexico, and the U.S. Uh, wind turbines that are the size of a football field or longer with tolerances to the millimeter. Uh, they make them for companies like Siemens and GE who can't make enough blades on their own, so they contract with TPI Composites to do it. Uh, that also means we've got a high degree of certainty on their production lines because they lease out those lines to individual companies, so we know exactly how much revenue is likely to come in, how much profits are likely to come in going forward. They've been generating some losses. They shut down some lines to make bigger blades, which are more efficient. Uh, they've had some co company, uh, uh, their com uh, client restructuring as well. One company went bankrupt, uh, so the, the, the government was going to take over that particular business. Uh, but by being in Turkey, Mexico, and the U.S., they can manufacture and supply from points that make sense for particular companies, uh, irregardless of tariffs and trade restrictions. Uh, you can see their margins have been going up quite a bit. Um, this is one of the best green energy plays that I'm aware of. Uh, there are not, no solar companies that I'm uh, particularly attracted to. This uh, allows you to get into the boom on green energy if you are so interested. So we've got to wrap it up there, but uh, my email address is in the handout, so feel free to email me there or step by our booth in the exhibit hall uh, where we can talk more about it. We've got a special offer at the, trade, at the show, the money show, where you can subscribe for a year. You get three free issues at our lowest price. Um, so if you want to take advantage of that, please stop by. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Uh, once again, please email me with any questions. Uh, and uh, thanks again. We'll see you at the next money show here in Philadelphia. I certainly hope.